Hello, one and all, and welcome to the first installment of Ranting and Racing. Now, some of you are wondering uh, what this show is. Uh, this is a show uh, where myself and my dear friend Landon Rock will uh, sort of walk through the week of motorsports, ranging anywhere from NASCAR to IndyCar, uh, IMSA, Formula One. We may even go outside of the of that realm from time to time. And uh, this is an idea that has had uh, that has had its roots before the pandemic. So, without further ado, I shall bring my co-host on screen here. Everybody, say hello to Landon Rock. Hello, hello. So, uh, I guess we'll start at the top here. Talk about you know sort of our racing history because the folks who are watching this they know that. I have, uh, well, they know that I'm very prevalent uh, here in the Tardon Media Network, but not all of them know about my racing fandoms. So uh, this year will mark 20 years since I have started uh, watching racing. And um, it will mark 20 years since I've started watching racing. I still remember the first race I ever watched, which was the uh, 2002 fall event at uh, Charlotte Motor Speedway. Jamie McMurray, who is one of that one there's favorite drivers, in just his second ever cup start, uh, went out, won his first race in just his second start ever in the Cup Series and held off the man who was two years removed from winning the Cup Championship, Bobby Labonte. And uh, I still, this is one of the things that'll stick with me till the day I die. I remember uh, seeing McMurray doing his burnouts and I looked up at mom and I said, I, I looked up at her and I said, why is he spinning out like that? And it's just, it, like I say, it's just one of those things that'll stick with you forever. And that seeded my love of motor racing and it's only grown from there and now it's going to manifest itself with this show and i cannot wait to finally get this thing off the ground so landon tell the folks uh a little bit about yourself as well uh yeah so my name is uh landon i've been a race fan my whole life uh it was introduced to me as a kid i watched it with my uh, family, my brother and my mom. Um, the first time I really remember racing was like 2006. I remember Kane having a really good year. Um, but I actually went to my first race and I think 2005 Richmond. No, 2004, maybe it was whatever one Dale jr. Won, uh, in the eight car, eight bud car. I remember that. Um, I left halfway through, but my, I think my mom stayed, um, but yeah, that was it. It's just grown from then. Uh, I've gotten into the designing part of it now. I've started to, to design race cars. Um, I go by Captain Online. That's my persona, I guess you could say over there. Um, but it's, I love it. I, I read about and watch it all day long. That's me as well. So now that you know a little bit about the motor heads with motor mouths, we can, uh, excuse me, we can pivot from there into you know, the racing part of this and let it go wherever we decide to take it. So uh, first thing on the docket, of course, is the race that is coming up this weekend, the Bush Clash. Now, normally uh, the Bush Clash is held at Daytona International Speedway, usually a week, 10 days before the Daytona 500. But that is not the case. This year, NASCAR has gone outside the box and has built inside of L.A. Coliseum a quarter-mile bullring-type track. And the clash is a little different this year also in that normally the field size would be capped at like, 
you know, 20, 25 cars, things like that. And it will be still be that way in a way, but now everybody has the chance to, um, to try and race their way in. And one of the things that uh, me and Landon and our other friend addressed in a, uh, in a sort of a preview stream last night is that with the part shortages that has been coming down the line uh, in terms of, you know, just overall everything, uh, would teams be able, or teams be willing, I should say, to take that risk? Would they be able, would they want to take that risk and junk a car that they would more than likely have to turn around and use as a backup car in the Daytona 500. What do you think? How do you think this is going to go? Landon? I don't know. Um, I think, I think it's going to go one of two ways. I think it's either going to be a wreck fest because they're just not going to know how to drive a, a, you know, that small of a track with those big of cars or people aren't going to take risks because from what I've read today, it seems like some of these drivers are going to be using their test cars, which don't have all of the like full next gen updates and everything. So oh, wow. they're literally riding on hopes and prayers on some of these cars. So I don't know. I think they're going to take it easy personally. Well, taking it easy as in as much as they're on a quarter mile racetrack with no room for error yeah. <laughs> whatsoever. But uh, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a wild, it's going to be interesting. I won't say wild because it could wind up being a total dud for all we know, but um, you know, it's just going to be more interesting than anything, seeing how these guys tiptoe around, if they tiptoe around at all. I mean, it like you said, it could very well be a wreck fest, you know, and with a lot of these guys using the cars that they built for testing and all, it uh it's really gonna be really gonna be, like I say, just really interesting to see how this fires off and how it is received and all. And furthermore, looking ahead to Daytona, if someone junks their car in LA at the clash, you know, how fast they're going to get that thing turned around for Daytona, because that's just in what a couple weeks away, two, three weeks away until the start of speed week. Weeks, so, yeah. yeah. So that's going to be something that, uh, is very interesting. And we will talk and we will give our clash predictions, uh, later on in the show. So, Second item on the docket is the trend continuing of just, you know, famous people getting into racing. And this is one that has been sort of a meme uh, in the racing community for the last couple, three years at this point. But earlier this week, it was made official. Floyd Mayweather. Yes, the famous fighter is starting a race team. Old Floyd Mayweather is starting a race team. It will debut at Daytona. Kaz Grala out of Massachusetts will be driving the car. And this is the car in question. And when I said, because we got to talking about this in the preview stream last night, I said something to the effect of that car Looks like Crayola throwed up. It literally looks like Crayola yeah. throwed up. But, you know, it's going to be another car added to the lineup, which is good because everyone was worried at the time, going back to the parts shortages and all, and teams building the Gen 7 and all, the fear was that we wouldn't get, we wouldn't get more than 40 cars for Daytona. We wouldn't send nobody home. Uh, for the to, for the in qualifying for the 500, so the Floyd Mayweather team is officially official. As you can see it there, the car is is it, the scheme is definitely something. It is definitely 
a thing. Right. And yeah, it's that's not much more than you can say about it, but they've got a good driver beneath them in Kaz Grala. <laughs> we've got uh like I say, we've got another big game sticking their neck out on NASCAR. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this now and talk about how it feels to have these big names coming back in because obviously we've got Michael Jordan, who owns half of 2311, which is Bubba Wallace and Kurt Busch's team. We've got Pitbull invested into uh, track house racing. And now we've got Floyd Mayweather's team getting up off the ground and actually going to see the light of day. So in this era, well, I shouldn't say era, but in this time where folks are, are peeling the bells talking about how NASCAR's popularity is declining and it's not as popular as it was from the mid nineties to the mid two thousands to see these big names coming up and joining into the sport. What, uh, what do you think might be the future of this? And do you think the future is in good hands in that regard? I think the future of the sport's definitely in good hands. Um, I well, if you look at um, oh, who was it? Might have been Pockers that tweeted it. Um, he said that there's like like seventy percent of the people going to the clash. This will be their first ever race. So yeah. I think the popularity is going back up, and it it's names like Pitbull and names like Michael Jordan and Money that are you know bringing some of these people back in, and I I love the trend that's happening right now track house is one of my favorite teams like of yes. all time i i love what they're doing i love their attitude i love you know the schemes everything i love everything i love suarez i love chastain track house is awesome um 23 is going in a good direction bubba got his first win uh last yeah. year at talladega that was huge for that team and they got denny hamlin so that team's going to be around i don't know about money's team if you read the press release about money's team it's basically starcom and is it really crazy. so i don't know yeah i just feel like it's money's name on it but it's not actually going to be that great of a race team i would love to be wrong personally but i don't know i just i i have some suspicion about it now this i didn't know i didn't know that they had basically purchased the assets of the old starcom team and they're you know, running that team as is, but you know, we've seen how someone big coming in like that can boost a team. I mean, just look at, look at when Tony Stewart bought half of the Haas team after 2008, look where they yeah, are now. Off with shit. And now Stuart Haas is a championship yeah. winning team. Oh yes. And, and the, they're only growing from there. And uh, so I'm, like I say, I'm very interested to see how Money's team goes. I know they're very closely affiliated with uh, Richard Childress Racing. They'll be running a limited schedule this year. I know they I think the official announcement said it was 15 races for uh, the 50 team in yep. 2022. They'll be focusing on the road courses, which is a big positive because Kaz, Kaz Grala kind of has that background, that road course racing background. And uh, I wish him well. I wish him well. And I yeah, think same. that, uh, I think, like I say, this could be the start of a really big trend. And I know that, you know, tra that uh, track house is wanting to go past two cars. 2311 wants to go more than two cars in the future and who knows maybe maybe if we look up in five years and we see that money's team is a fringe playoff contender it wouldn't surprise me at all so very much looking yeah, forward maybe. to that yes very much looking forward to that and i'm keen to see how Grala does in making the 500 because in the limited cup starts that he's had he's been superb he was had a fast run in his starts with colleague last year filled in for uh austin Dillon, 
I think two years ago, was it two years ago at the Daytona road course was yeah. inside the top 10 yep. was threatening for the top five. And then I think had an engine go South or transmission issues or something like that. And uh, no, that he finished seventh. He oh, he finished seventh. seventh. He actually stayed. See that yep, Mandela. Yeah. That Mandela effect. I thought, See, it broke something. I thought he had like <laughs> blown the motor or tore the transmission out of it or something. Of course, I'm lucky to remember last week, much less two years ago. But uh, <laughs> but uh, we will, but yeah, Grala's gonna get it. Grala's got the best chance he's had. And I know there's a lot of people, especially recently, that have been really on their soapbox for Kaz to get a full time ride, and I've been one of them, I will admit. Kaz is one of those types. Yep, I'm where, one. Yep. Kaz is one of those types where he can just get in anything and take off with it. He he's just got that pure raw talent, and I cannot wait. I cannot wait to see how I'm a he big fan of Kaz excels in the Cup Series. So we will now go from. Uh, Floyd Mayweather to the Rolex 24 and the news and happenings inside of it and a finish to the uh, Rolex 24 that you don't need that it, a type of finish that you don't really see uh, in sports car racing all that often. So Elio Castroneves won the Rolex 24 again. The man is we talk about Tom Brady you know, how long he's been in the NFL and he's just now hanging it up. I would say that uh, Elio is just starting to catch a second wind. He is starting to catch a second wind. He's coming off of his fourth Indy 500 win last year, becoming just, I think, the fourth driver to ever win four Indianapolis 500s. And, uh, like I say, he's coming off of this win here in the Rolex 24 in just an absolutely batshit finish uh, down at Daytona. I think it, it oh came down God. to the class leaders. It came down to the class leaders uh, in the one of the other divisions crashing GTD out. Pro. GTD Pro. So it came down to those to the class leaders in that division getting together, and that set the stage for, like I say, you, it set the stage for the one of the wildest finishes we have ever seen in the uh, in the world of uh, sports car racing. We've not really seen a finish. Well, we've seen great finishes in IMSA since then, but we haven't really seen like this crazy of a finish since um, Jan Bergmeister and who was it that got together at Laguna Seca like in 09, I believe? It was Gilles de Ferrand's final. I don't even final. remember that. It was, it was Jan Bergmeister and one of the Corvettes. It was one of the team Corvette guys got into it, but this was, Oh, Oh, I do remember yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just absolutely insane. And I'm trying to find a video to show, I'm trying to find a video that's short enough to show it uh, on here, but I'm not having any luck in doing so. Oh, wait, here we go. So I think I might have, uh, the video teed up here of the finish, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to the Rolex 24. So, uh, again, congrats to Elio Castro Nevis. What is he, 46? 46 years old and still out here oh God, winning yeah. races on the highest uh, level. So, if I can get a screen share, there we go. Go. I show the finish to the Rolex 24. And the video isn't wanting to play, but 
That is that's no. That's now, and has, has the leader gone has past, the, past these guys? These guys? No, he no, has, has not yet. So, so they might have one more so the go the the on the inside the right side of the flap car. And the flap car has been placed and he lost the lead, gets it back again. It's changed again. And Vanto has to. So, yeah, we're having uh, some issues showing the finish uh, to that race. But no big deal. It was still just absolutely insane uh, between uh, the the leaders there. Again, Elio Castroneves comes through in the clutch again. Meyer Shank, by the way, is just rocking and rolling now in both IndyCar and in IMSA now. And uh, it's just a thrill to see how that team has grown over the last several years. I still remember the first time they won the 24. I think Almendinger was on that team, 2013 or 2014, yes, he was. I remember something that. like that. God, and just to see how high they've risen since that time, it's just it, – it's a true rags-to-riches story team. in American motorsports. It's a true rags-to-riches story in American motorsports. So – uh, we will now turn our attention. Speaking of IndyCar, uh, we'll t cross, we'll touch a little bit on potential IndyCar Formula One crossovers because you know we've seen several IndyCar drivers speaking out, it's particularly uh, Pato Award, Joseph Newgarden, Colton Herta, uh, talking about possibly Roman Grosjean. Roman Grosjean. Well, Roman Grosjean's going the other way though. Well, he well, he went the other way, but oh, then yeah, reversed yeah. himself again. Yeah, he went back to Formula One this year from IndyCar. But uh, still, you know, we're seeing guys like Pato Award and Colton Herta and Joseph Newgarden all saying that, you know, we would love to try Formula One sometime in the near future. So I want to ask, who do you think uh, – who do you think Mike could – bust out of IndyCar and go to Formula One and have a lot of success? I think I think the best possibility of someone from IndyCar going to Formula One and having a lot of success, I think it'd be Colton Herta. I think that guy just has so much raw talent and is so young that he could go over there, adapt really well, and just – kill it i don't know what team but i think he could do it who else could you see i mean other than pato and uh new guard <laughs> um alexander ross is a name to come to mind just because i think he loves to race and he's got a very buck wild attitude um so i don't know how that would work in formula one but i think it'd be cool to see um it would maybe be, will power would... you know the aussie he might go over there he could he could really do good. Now, turning that question around a little bit, Formula One drivers possibly going over to IndyCar. Now, I know I know this will likely never happen, though his stance on for on, on IndyCar has softened over the last few years. But you know, Lewis Hamilton, it seems like every year we hear he's always getting sick with Formula One. He's wanting out. He's wanting to try something new. He's wanting to step away and do all of this stuff. If Lewis Hamilton left Formula One and tried his hand in IndyCar, I think that would be as big, if not bigger, than Mario Andretti leaving CART and going to Formula One all those years ago. I think Hamilton is mm -hmm. the type yeah, of thing that IndyCar, yeah. yes, IndyCar, uh, Lewis Hamilton is the type of person that IndyCar needs in the worst way to grow an international audience. And if he did come over and landed a ride with, I don't know, Penske or someone like that, it would really put a lot of eyes on IndyCar worldwide. 
Yeah. So who do you who do you think uh who do you think from Formula One would make that leap to IndyCar? I have two names that come to mind when I think about Formula One and IndyCar. Um, the first one is uh, Lando Norris. I think Norris yes. would have a fun time in IndyCar. Mm. Um, he, I, he does. I, I'm not. I'm not the biggest fan of Formula One. Uh, that's very publicly known. Um, but <laughs> the little bit I know about Lando Norris, his attitude and the way he drives, he seems like he would fit right in at IndyCar. So I, that's number one. Uh, number two, I think Max Verstappen could make a cool intro into uh, yes. IndyCar. Verstappen and uh, Norris would really be two. And I think, doesn't Norris – see, wait a minute. Norris isn't still with McLaren, is he? Is yes, he? he is. Oh, he's still with McLaren. So mm -hmm. I know with McLaren having – their IndyCar team, their ever growing and ever faster IndyCar team. It wouldn't surprise me if we looked up at the winter tests in Sebring in a couple of years and saw Lando uh, getting a shot at testing an IndyCar. So uh, I'd love to see it. Yes. So we'll uh, start to wrap this up a little bit. Uh, this will be longer, by the way, in the future. This is just, this is our first episode and we hit tech gremlins early on, which kind of, kind of kept it from being a full hour. But um, nevertheless, we are trucking along and we are persisting. So as I mentioned earlier, we will touch on uh, the Bush clash here, give some predictions about who we think will win it, who, what might happen in the race, and then kind of turn our sights, <coughs> excuse me, toward early speed weeks predictions as well. So we'll start obviously with the Bush clash. And so who do you think comes out of the bull ring brawl victorious? I think it's going to be Joey Logano. I don't want it to be, but I think it will be. What makes you say Logano? I just think Logano has that – well, he's from New England, right? So he's got that, like, yeah. short track modified kind of attitude. But That's true. I think the biggest thing is he's just going to, like, go ham and just not care. And I think that's going to ultimately get him to the front, and he's fast. Yeah. Yeah. And though here's the thing about Logano though that Northeast they've got bigger they've got they're not like the South they don't have you know, Bowman Grays and Hickories and Caraways and things like that to run on they've got half mile and five yeah. eighths mile and even three quarter mile tracks up there so if it, it mm -hmm. takes a lot more patience instead of just rooting people out of the way like they have in the South now with that in mind huh. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go off the beaten path here, and I'm gonna say that Ricky Stenhouse Jr. wins the clash. Ricky, you think Ricky. Ricky's gonna win? I mean, you want aggressiveness? What's the explanation there. You want aggressiveness? You want someone that's a battering ram on four wheels? You want someone that'll dive bomb in That's there and true. take a chance and give no fucks in the process. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. I think is going to be that guy. Though his that. though his short track experience is more on dirt, but I think it would I think he'll really be a force to be reckoned with uh before uh the night is over with on is it Saturday night or Sunday night? that the clash is happening. Uh, I want to say Saturday night. Saturday night. <laughs> you can, yeah, this is, we're off to a rolling start on this first episode. Neither of us know the exact date of the race we're talking about. <laughs> but Saturday <laughs> or Sunday, Saturday or Sunday, it will happen. It will happen. So Landon has Joey Logano. I'm going a bit outside the box. I am saying Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Now I have, I have a question about the clash before we 
wrap that up yet. Okay. Interesting question here. Do you think, number one, a big-name driver misses? And number two, if you do, who do you think it is? I think a big-name driver will miss, uh, though I don't know exactly who. So th- what's what's the official – what's the field size for the A main in the Clash? Do you know? Is it like 20 cars or 25? Uh, it is – it's 20 – 23 cars because uh, Larson has one spot and 22 others getting it through the heat. Uh, There will be four heats and two LCQs. So there's a lot of opportunities to get in. Um, Mm -hmm. But I I do think a big name driver misses it. I personally think it's going to be Brad Keselowski. I think he's going to have a hiccup in his first race with RFK. I think he's going to mess him up. So you think Brad in his first time out in that six car is going to miss the show. Who I think I think he's gonna have a hiccup. Something will happen. I think a big name driver misses it as well, and I'm gonna. You know who I'm gonna say it's gonna be? Kurt Busch. Kurt Busch, simply because he doesn't really have. He's not. He doesn't really have that bullring type experience that. A lot of the younger guys do, and uh, I mean, he does have a lot of experience on his side. Don't get me wrong, but nothing really in a tight, confined bullring space like this. So, um, True. I could see, I could see Kurt missing out, and that would be a huge story if he did miss out on the clash. So, you said twenty-three spots. Four heats, two LCQs. Larson's the only one guaranteed yep. in. Okay. Yep. So that should be a very, excuse me, a very interesting, uh, excuse me, set of races for Saturday night. And ladies and gentlemen, that has been the premiere episode of Ranting and Racing. Even though we had Tech Gremlins to start. We had to redo this twice. We got through it. We got through it. And I promise you this will be longer and more involved next time because we didn't have any guests on this particular episode. It was just myself and Landon powering through. But I say we managed. We persevered. And now all we have to do is tell the folks goodbye. So... Thank you one and all for watching this and coming out and showing love on the first installment of Ranting and Racing. This has been a wonderful time. I'm so happy to finally get this thing off the ground after two years of waiting on it. So for Landon Rock, all of us here, I am John Phipps saying so long until next week.